My name is Nick Mothershaw. I'm the Chief Identity Strategist at the Open Identity Exchange. And we're a members organization for the uh, identity community. Our vision is that all of us can have a reusable, trusted digital identity that we can use uh, ubiquitously anywhere around the world. Um, so that's something about me, but I'm chairing the panel today. Uh, and joining me today, uh, we've got uh, Jonathan Williams, I'm the Payment Systems Regulator, um, Fabian Abela from Keyless, and Annette Steenbergen uh, from the Government of Aruba. Welcome this morning to, to this panel. And um, we're going to be talking today about adoption and how can we drive adoption of digital identity. Um, but I was going to kick off by asking each of the panelists to just to introduce themselves. A little bit about who they are and who they work for. And um, also to... Uh, we'll then go to some kind of initial questions. But what I'm really keen on is to get some questions from you, uh, the audience, and, and those of you online as well, uh, who can ask questions. Think, listen to what we're saying, and, uh, and let's make this a, an interactive session uh, rather than just a panel chat. But uh, Jonathan, perhaps if I could turn to you first, if you could just introduce uh, who you are and, and where you're from. So yeah. I'm a, a payment specialist at the Payment Systems Regulator, and you probably won't have come across the Payment Systems Regulator, but we are one of those organisations sitting alongside the Financial Conduct Authority, the Competition and Markets Authority, HM Treasury, the Bank of England, and so on, which regulate financial services in the UK. Our focus is on ensuring that payment systems are operated and developed in the, ne the needs of payment service users like ourselves, like individuals and businesses. Uh, and we want to make sure that, that innovation and competition are actually supported by those systems and they, and they work well for everyone. When I think about identity, I think in terms of payments about a number of different things. And the, the, I think the, the, one of the, the challenges is um, when we make a payment, we want to pay somebody rather than somebody else. And that's why I think this discussion around identity is, is absolutely important uh, in terms of how our payment systems evolve, but also our other use cases as well. Yeah. Jonathan, thank you. Fabian? Yeah, thank you. Good morning, <coughs> everybody. Um, this is Nick. I'm Fabian, uh, co-founder of Keyless. Uh, we're <coughs> on a mission to enable anyone to access any service from any device and keep our personal data safe, private, and under our own control. Oh. Pioneering privacy preserving biometrics uh, for passwordless online systems uh, that allows us to do so um, with devices not yet uh, necessarily keep the data in one place. Um, and yeah, I'm excited about the topic uh, because <coughs> I, yeah, I believe it's one of the biggest unsolved challenges we still have on the internet in our daily lives today. Um, and we're hoping to be contributing to, the, to one of uh, the solutions for it. Thank you. And uh, Annette? I use yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is <coughs> sorry. My name is Annette Steinberg. I work for the government of Aruba. Um, I ended up in uh, digital identity because we uh, in Aruba were by accident the very first in the world to create a seamless and contactless fas passenger facilitation at the airport using a biometric single token. Um, that was in 2015, so um, a lot has happened since then. And uh, especially in the world of travel, a lot is happening. Um, so exciting times. Thank you. Um, so what, what I'd like to know first from each of you on the panel, really, is you know, we're talking about adoption. And from your perspective, why would you or your organization want to adopt digital identity? What, what do you see as the benefits and drivers to do so? Um, Fabian, if I come to you first. Yes, uh, so I believe it <coughs> will offer, uh, firstly, better convenience, so more convenience for users um, and organizations alike. If you think of digital identity, it's the front door to pretty much anything we do, whether that's banking, education. Now, in the world of a pandemic, uh, pretty much everything has gone digital and remote, and we need um, a secure but also convenient way um, to verifying that we are who we claim to be online. Um, and so first of all, it, it offers more convenience uh, if we're able to prove uh, and yeah, authenticate or identify ourselves in a way with just one click or one look uh, into a camera. 
um, rather than having usernames and passwords, which are yeah, quite non-personal and relatively insecure. Um, on the other side, it also offers um, greater efficiency, uh, lower cost, um, if you're thinking of yeah, just logging into um, services, but also yeah, travel, banking, and so forth. Um, so there's that long-lasting trade-off of user experience on the one side, often traded against privacy or security on the other. Uh, but if there is yeah, a proper framework around digital identity, um, there is a balance that can be achieved uh, to be supporting and helping all of us. Brilliant. Thanks, Annette. And Annette, from your perspective, what, what, what would make you adopt or how well, to adopt? Um, specifically mm -hmm. for uh, travel, before yeah. COVID, uh, there was, we were facing an immense growth, uh, 3.7 billion people traveling uh, by air per year. And that was set to double to in 15 to 20 years to about 7 billion. Now you can't double a Heathrow or a Schiphol. That's plainly impossible. So you have to find ways to uh, get people to be ready to arrive, ready to fly when they arrive. And so everything, the whole uh, process of uh, checking in, etc., should be done off airport. Um, the aim then is to have a walking pace experience and um, of obviously use a digital uh, identity. Um, however, then COVID struck um, and things changed. Um, we now need, uh, well, the numbers of travelers are down and growing steadily again, but we have uh, the health credentials uh, digitally, preferably, in the mix. So what we need for travel now is to still uh, have people not uh, queue up at airports because that becomes a health hazard nowadays. So we need to know you are okay, your identity is okay, but also your health credentials are okay before you travel. So it comes down to what we were already busy with before COVID, which was facilitation and security. So a fast and seamless process that is very secure because crossing a border has to do with national security. It has to do with border management and inspection. So uh, a 50-50 uh, equal level uh, uh, aim of uh, a faster, better passenger experience and at the same time a better and more secure border management. Brilliant. Thank you. Jonathan, from your perspective. So I think um, from a payment perspective, and bear in mind I work for the payment systems regulator, um, we could look at a number of things which need identity solutions and some of them are being talked about later on in the conference. So uh, things like, for example, onboarding and KYC and strong customer authentication, they're all identity related solutions. But let me talk about one which I guess doesn't get as much airtime, which is the issue around what's called authorised push payment fraud. Um, and that's where, for example, you might get an invoice uh, from your builder. Um, it might uh, detail what they've delivered to you. It might ask for payment for some, some amount of money and give you a bank account to, to, to go make the payment to. And, and of course, that's what we'd normally do. We, we'd look at the, the invoice, we'd check it was our builder. Yes, it's our builder. Make the payment to the bank account. In the case of authorised push payment fraud, though, a fraud has managed to get into that chain and has then changed the bank details to an account in their control. And that means that our money doesn't go to our builder, it goes to the fraudsters, goes into a big financial crime pool which then gets money laundered uh, to all number of dif different destinations. So there's a challenge there that when we're accepting things like payment details, um, we want to be able to link that bank account to the actual person or company that we want to pay. And that's one of the challenges. The payment systems regulators have done a certain amount of work on this, on what's called confirmation of payee. Uh, so that's when you make a payment online through your mobile banking or your online banking. It checks the name against the account number and says, well, is this really Nick Mothershaw that you want to go and pay? Uh, yes, that's fine. I'm perfectly happy with that. Um, obviously, if you're dealing with that in a, a case where you're remote from that, you from, from the, the individual, you want to be able to go and trust that identity, trust the information associated with it. You want to be able to know that that bank account detail you're about to pay £5,000, maybe more to, is really the uh, intended recipient. And that's one of the areas where confirmation of pay does a, a good first step. It confirms the name, but if, for example, you have a name which is a little bit more common, like mine, 
J. Williams, um, there could be multiple matches across the UK in terms of accounts that that money could be paid into uh, fraudulently. So we're, one of the key things to try and understand about digital identity is how that could support rule, uh, rubbing out this t particular type of fraud, trying to prevent it, trying to detect it. And I think digital identity is one of those key things which will help with that part of the process, especially when we're transacting online. Brilliant. So we, we can see the, the need for it in, in various different sectors and, and the advantages. Um, so if that need's there, why, why aren't we all using digital identity today? Why, why, aren't, why haven't we adopted this brilliant solution? And um, I know if I could go back to you. Um, what, what, what's, the, you know, what's stopping you at the moment? What, what do you need to happen to make this a reality? Well, for, uh, and I've, I've mentioned this uh, several times, but if you want to cross a border, uh, you cannot use a commercial identity or your bank identity mm. or your Facebook identity. You need to use an official travel document uh, that is uh, handed to you by your government uh, that you have the nationality of. So if you want to have a digital version of that, we need government's involvement. Um, and uh, governments are working towards this. Uh, ICAO, the International Civil Aviation, has developed a digital travel credential, of course, with contracting states in a working group, so it's not ICAO itself, but it's, you know, the member states. And um, so there is a standard, a first standard, that is uh, still linked to your physical document, but you can make a uh, digital travel credential to use. Um, and it's there. Um, technology is there. We need... Uh, Governments to be able to say, I want to receive this because it's not just using it and, and, and making a digital identity, uh, onboarding one, but it's also, make, it's also about receiving it and receiving the data and how are we dealing with that. So there is probably rules and regulations involved and a lot of governments are still struggling sometimes legally. How do we um, uh, recognize this? How can we receive this? Um, but uh, specifications are there, um, technology is there, we probably need some more rules and regulations. And uh, it, it's, um, at some point I always say, just say Nike yeah. principle, just do it. Yeah. And some countries should start. Yeah. Yeah. So um, impatiently waiting for yeah. that. <laughs> so there's an interesting tension there, isn't there, between the, the just, just do it and the need for more rules and regulations. Yeah. It's not, it's not often you, you hear someone say, well, we need more rules and regulations. Yeah. <laughs> Working for a government, of course, yeah. Yeah. we need rules and regulations. And especially if, if we're talking digital uh, identity in travel, using biometrics, we need the highest privacy and data protection regulations because this is super sensitive data of the highest nature. So uh, if that ends up uh, in wrong hands, uh, then your your whole identity is in, in, in someone's hands. So... Um, I can be impatient about it, but I totally understand that we need proper rules and regulations um, and, uh, and safeguarding. Absolutely. Yeah. F Fabian, from, from your perspective, what, what, what's stopping this, this great idea being a reality? Yes, I would yeah. <coughs> come back to that initial trade-off of user experience on the one side uh, and privacy and security on the other. Yeah. Um, with <coughs> one of the underlying challenges for all of that being the password, that we use daily. And believe it or not, a simple password reset can cost an organization up to $70. A account takeover fraud has skyrocketed on the consumer side. Um, and even IT professionals use the same password. More than 50% of IT professionals, um, according to Gartner, use the same password across all their accounts. Um, so it's not that just the average person <laughs> is reusing the same password. Um, and if we, if you look at the, the evolution of authentication starting from the password in the 1960s to added layers of security like um, hardware, the smart cards or tokens, additional second token authenticator applications here we go into the <coughs> area of um, yeah, strong customer authentication having to combine at least two out of three factors, a possession factor, inheritance factor like your biometric and uh, a knowledge factor like a one-time password, a PIN, to what we call biometrics that we know from our smartphones, smartphones today and if you were to ask the average person on the street about biometric authentication, they would probably mention Face ID uh, by Apple, uh, which isn't really authenticating or identifying anybody. It's unlocking the, 
the device as a factor of possession that you're proving. Uh, in most cases, you're still sharing a secret um, through that. Um, you're bound to that one device, which is your identity, um, that you use. If you upgrade, lose, or forget a device, you can't authenticate or identify yourself anymore. Um, so <clears throat> backup recovery issues with device um, native biometrics is still an issue. Uh, hence, it's not interoperable uh, and not really usable. Um, on the other side, if you're talking about biometric authenticate, real biometric authentication, um, you would have to store that biometric data somewhere. Um, and having that in a central database or honeypot, whether that's a government, a private company, uh, is far from a great idea. Uh, that's why we're having device-based um, biometrics. But there is a way to be solving that dilemma. Um, there's breakthroughs in privacy-enhancing technologies, um, cryptographic techniques like secure multi-party computation and so forth that can solve it and have that universal biometric credential in the cloud that is accessible from any device um, that allows someone to yeah, verify their identity attributes in a more personal way. Um, but yeah, it's still, it's still a way of um, yeah, addressing that initial trade-off of getting something that is usable. Um, so there needs to be use cases and acceptance for it. Yeah. At the same time, it cannot compromise on, on the security and especially the privacy uh, aspects. Yeah. Um, and certainly if you're looking at that from a European lens. Yeah, and that's interesting that you, so you're saying that the the biometric needs to come off the device and into the cloud so that it so that it's not bound to the device so that I can use it anywhere. So if I'm wandering through the airport, I'm not constantly using my device to prove who I am. It's just me. It's just my face that is is is, is a proof point. Yeah, it's interesting, interesting. Um, but that's complex, isn't it? It's technically complex to. To, to do, and it fits in a lot of the you know the distributed or decentralised approach that we're hearing so much in identity today. That you know we don't want to put all these biometrics in a central database because that is a honeypot. Um, so we need that balance between on device and centralised, which is this distributed approach that that you're advocating for. Correct. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. So J Jonathan, from from coming back to you, what? Why, are, why isn't this being used in the payments industry today? So that's a really good question. So I think to a large extent, I mean, a lot of the solutions that have been built for by payment service providers for digital onboarding, for example, so scanning government documents, matching those to the, the, the face uh, at the point of presentation, those are all the solutions which are out there in the market. But the challenge is linking all of those individual points together to make a sensible decision on to whether this is Nick Mothershaw or not. Um, there are all sorts of interesting use cases associated with that. And the, the challenge is that, that a lot of payments are, because we want to pay somebody or pay a company, that identity uh, question uh, may not be quite as straightforward as you might think. So you might, for example, want to pay your insurer, and your insurer you've always known as, um, for example, uh, Aviva. But Aviva has gone through a number of different name changes over the years, and so the particular account you may be trying to pay may be known as CG Norwich Union, for example. Um, so there's a question about that identity. Can you use your Norwich Union uh, name? Will that match against the identity of Aviva, which is a, a new business? So th th there's an interesting question about trying to ma do that matching. But for me, one of the big challenges is actually use of this. If we're going to be using this for, for payments, then it's not going to, it's going to have to be used, well, weekly, certainly, not once a year. If you're going to have to go through that pain, as we've heard, of resetting your password, resetting your access to your digital ID every year, which is what used to happen with payments of, of tax, for example, in the UK, you'd have a, an account with the government, uh, the only time you ever used it was to pay your tax, uh, and therefore the challenge was, well, what was my password that I set last year? I'm going to have to reset it. So that you end up with a password reset challenge every time you want to use it. That's not really going to help your, government, your uh, use of digital identity. So we need to be using it all the time. And things like Bank ID in Scandinavia, where it's used much more frequently for all sorts of different services, that underpins it. So I think if we have a digital identity, it can't just be for payments. It has to be for multiple different services, and we have to be using it, and we have to be familiar with using it, and understanding what the limitations of that are, and be able to use it 
all the way across the population, not just the, the favored few who have the, the, the appropriate smartphone devices or are able to use that particular type of authentication. We need to make sure it's accessible too. And is, is that important? So it's important that the user has a, is using it frequently so they don't have the password going that, that's that, that tax example. I mean, we used to operate a system where we did exactly that. And on the 31st of January, you'd have people trying to reset the password and then messing it up. And then they get to the point where their only recourse was a, a letter, a PIM letter in the post, which wouldn't arrive until like the 2nd or 3rd of February, by which time they'd missed the deadline and they got a fine. So you know, cl clearly we need to move away from that, that kind of impedance on, on, on users' day-to-day uh, -day lives. Um, does it have to be the same identity that we use everywhere? Or can we have different identities for different purposes? So go back to travel. You, know, you, know, you said earlier that you need a government official document-based identity, not something from a bank. So are we going to have a, you know, the ability to use the same identity everywhere, or are we going to end up with different identities for different purposes, do you think? Well, if we look at the non-digital world, we open a bank account and we bring our passport or our national identity card. Mm. Uh, if we go to the doctor and uh, say, I want to, can you be my GP? He says, can you please identify yourself? Um, if I want to buy a house, I'll use my passport or my ID. So I think if we make it simple, could we just have a government-issued digital identity that we could use? Uh, but um, we have to use it in a self-sovereign way so that if I want to buy a bottle of wine and they doubt whether I'm old enough, I just show my digital identity and what the uh, wine seller sees is just a green check mark that I'm 18 and older. It doesn't see my full uh, identity details. I think that's really important. But if it's one issuer, which is the government, who also issues my passport and who also issues my national identity card uh, and my driver's license, by the way, which are all government issued, then wouldn't that be easier? Because we just have one source. We don't have to say, we don't have to discuss what we will use, we have this. But the precondition is that I, can, I should be able to use it the way I want to use it. I will only be able to share what I want to share in a self-sovereign manner. So that's really yeah. crucial. Uh, and do you think uh, people will you mention that that's a government-based identity? So to uh, use my driving license, I, I don't anymore, unfortunately. If, if I was asked to prove my age to buy alcohol, I'd use my driving license. Um, when I do that at the moment, I know I'm taking a card out of my wallet and I'm showing someone the card, and I know that the government doesn't know that. Yes, exactly. But so the government. How, you know, if it's a government based identity, are people going to be worried about the government knowing everything they do, all, all the think, alcohol they buy, and all the. I think it, if it's self sovereign, and if all that uh, uh, wine salesman needs to know is a green check, if, he all, if all he or she sees is a green check, that's all. Yeah. It's just a signal is, is sent, and it's not shared with the government because it's on my phone. It's on my mobile device. I choose to share it, and I know because of a, the trust that's behind it, which is crucial, and hopefully a trust mark on whatever scanning device uh, the wine salesman is showing me mm. to, uh, to prove that I'm 18 years and older. If, if there is in society uh, that established trust, because we are reusing and we do this on a daily basis. It's not, I'm not showing it to some machine, but uh, I know that, oh, this is always what you do, and I see a little trust mark uh, that says, you, re I recognize, then I can, I, I probably feel fine to use it. Yeah. But it should be explained, there should be, you know, um, education about how to use your identity, that it's on your phone, that it's self-sovereign, that you choose to share it, uh, plus you must be aware to not share it anywhere. I think that's crucial. So that's, you, you hit on a really key point there, I mean, ed education. Yes. To, to make this a success, we're going to need education for the end users so they, so they understand yeah. not just what it is, but how it works and, and yeah. the fact that it's, that it's safe. I feel very strongly about that because there is such, I mean, we are in, 
working in identity, and I find it, it's, a, it's just chaotic right now. There's so much happening. There's no, I don't see the overview. Uh, and if we don't see the overview, do you think any citizen just living their life, not busy in this business, knows what's going on? So you must educate to make sure that people don't just share and, and, and send off their details. That's really, really, really crucial. Absolutely. And uh, Fabian, coming back to you on, on, on with the biometrics lens on that. So how, you know, there's a lot of fear with consumers around biometrics. So there's, there's a, on one hand, there's a kind of, well, I use it on my phone. Everyone's comfortable with it, but then if you read the press, you know, we should all be fearful of biometrics and you know, being monitored all the time. How do, we, uh, how do we get over to users that, this is, that biometrics are, are fine, that they are safe? Yeah. And in particular, that they can't be stolen. That's what people worry about, I think. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a very good point. Also, just to, to comment on uh, Annette's point, I, I strongly believe in self-sovereignty about how we make use of our data and the user control or the personality about the data mm. and the choice for to selectively disclosing identity information. Um, at the same time, it needs to be interoperable, just like credit card networks. It's not just one. It cannot be a private company. It cannot be just one nation state. We have, in Europe, the IDAS regulation to make it interoperable, at least across European countries. Um, but then it's still, for example, if in, in how that self-sovereign identity system works, where you have, um, you are the user, you have an issuer who's providing you with a credential and a verifier who's accepting that credential, which could be a health credential like our COVID um, or the, the vaccination um, certificate that we show, for example, this morning, um, where you show a QR code but you still don't know whether that QR code that I've shown is a screenshot that I've been sent this morning or mm. if it's truly belonging to me. Mm. If you were to add a biometric credential to it, then you would be sure that that credential, and you know it's issued by the UK government, by the German government in my case, or, mm. or otherwise, that it belongs to me uh, and it's a trusted source and a credential that you can trust without having me to show my entire passport and my vaccination history um, and so forth. So having the biometric credential uh, is crucial to allowing for usable, interoperable digital identity. Mm -hmm. At the same time, users, for very good reason, are fearful of having biometrics used. And there is a distinction between authentication and a one-to-one -one match in biometric authentication, mm -hmm. or the surveillance use case, which most cases are fearful for, in having cameras uh, everywhere that know that, oh, I'm walking uh, around the streets, it's me at this time, at this location. Um, which is not meant for authentication, but a one-to-many match um, in yeah, surveying people. But then the, the biometric storage problem is still the same. If it's on device, there's not much, and it's not just stored um, on the device, it's on a secure enclave, so a trusted chip um, on the device uh, that is very hard to hack. It's still possible, but very hard. Uh, but if you lose it, your biometric is not somewhere in the cloud that anyone could access or hack into. Um, but if you want to make it interoperable, it has to be that way. Um, so having it stored in one central server, no matter who hosts that, um, is, yeah, it's a big risk um, from, from many perspectives. From a privacy compliance security perspective, if a company does it from a risk management perspective, yes, there could be a GDPR fine, but so what? Mm. Um, and yeah, if, if, if we want to, to make it feasible, or at least the approach that we're taking is, is applying really novel cryptographic techniques um, that allow for that one-to-one -one biometric matching in a device agnostic way with having that data stored on a distributed architecture that could be run by governments, that could be run by a consortium of banks. Um, but the, the important point is that no stakeholder in the system has the ability, mathematically provably, the ability to reconstruct or recombine the biometric template, um, but it's transformed when you authenticate into yeah, cryptographic key material, I want to become too technical. Um, but this is one way to be addressing this, um, and I'm sure there, there may be other ways to, to solving the trade-off. Um, but yeah, that, that balance we need to strike in having, a bio, having the need for a biometric credential, but making it usable in a way where that is not centrally stored um, is something that, in our opinion, needs to be, needs to be solved. I, I, yeah, I, I agreed, absolutely. And my, my, my bank collected an off-device biometric from me a couple of weeks ago. Um, 
So, and which is done so, it tells me to authorise large payments in future. So that was, you know, evidence that banks are moving in that direction. Is uh, Jonathan, from a payments perspective, is that is that a good thing that they're they're bringing biometrics in for approval and moving away from pins and passwords and and the likes? Well, it's certainly the case that most payment service users don't really particularly like using passwords. I mean, we're ha perfectly happy making PIN transactions uh, at the retailer, but, but actually long passwords when we're logging in uh, via e-commerce to go and authorise card transactions, that's something that, that we don't genuinely really like. And so if there was a more transparent, easy way of doing it, we as payment service users would probably like that. But I would say that there is actually some benefit in demonstrating to, to me as a cardholder or me as a bank account holder that, that some security is being done. I have some confidence that there is some security be, being applied. And if we're going to rule out things like passwords, then we've only got really possession and inheritance, biometrics or behavioural biometrics uh, and things that we own. So if we're using the mobile phone, that's one of the things that we own. And the behavioural biometrics, can we uniquely identify us, or at least confirm it's our identity associated uh, with those sorts of things based on the way we hold our device or click on menus or navigate a website. All of those sorts of things can be additional factors um, which will help give the payment service provider confidence that it really is me coming back as opposed to somebody else trying to take over my account. Uh, and that's one of the important things, I guess, that when we're enrolling somebody into a... To, uh, take them out on board as a new customer, that we have enough different methods of authenticating them because inevitably something's going to happen. Uh, I lose my mobile phone, uh, I've been doing do-it-yourself over the weekend and my fingerprints or fingerprint scanner have been sanded off. Um, uh, for some reason my facial recognition, I may have the mumps, and I, uh, my facial recognition doesn't work for whatever reason. All sorts of reasons, all sorts of use cases which could mean that my authentication would fail and I couldn't make a payment. Um, so we need to think about all of the use cases and how we might get around those. If I haven't got a signal for my mobile phone, how do I still authenticate? It really is me when I need to go and buy something at the corner shop. So I think we need to think about all the different non-good use cases, the, 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 the not straightforward flows, and make sure that we've got those covered. And especially the ones where we are getting back in control of our account if, for example, one of the, those authentication mechanisms has been compromised. Uh, and for payment services, it's the Financial Conduct Authority which looks after strong customer authentication. Uh, and these are the sorts of things which, which they're thinking about as they supervise payment, uh, payment service provider firms. Mm -hmm. So I think there's some interesting challenges. When I look at the... Talking about, about government-issued digital identities, coming back to that, the... Um, FATF, the anti-money laundering and anti-terrorist financing organisation, um, published a digital identity thing. I'm sure that the, many people in the audience will have read it. But what's interesting is it, it suggests, strongly suggests, that any identity, especially digital identity solution, should be based on government ID. And I think that's good, but bear in mind its audience is governments and financial services organisations, which are regulated or very risk averse or governmental so mm. you can understand why that was sort of preaching to the converted i think that maybe there may be di different approaches using self-sovereign identity for example which can really help using other mm. other different types of identity factors so there's some interesting challenges interesting use cases around payments making payments but also preventing payments which we want to prevent mm. brilliant thank you so it's a, some kind of government endorsed self-sovereign identities probably where we need to get to, which certainly feels that's where the EU's going with, with the IDAS changes and the EU digital identity wallet. Um, we've only got a few minutes left now. I'm just going to turn to the audience to see if you've got any, any questions for the panel or, Laura, if we've got any, any coming in online. Yeah. A question over there. Uh, good morning. Hope everybody had their coffee uh, this morning. In the physical sciences, when systems get complex and uh, it, it, it's usually the case, our underlying hypothesis or our understanding of the universe is wrong, the Copernican revolution. Uh, I think identity systems are at the same state. They're too complicated and com complexity is the, uh, 
because uh, you're creating all this complexity in back end, all these silos of back end systems in KYC. So uh, I, I'd like the uh, panel to hypothesize if you had to build this from scratch using simple principles and data minimization. Um, I mean, if you look at the My Data operators and the My Data paper from 2017, it has a much simpler architecture. Uh, I'm wondering if you care to hypothesize what a built from built from scratch uh, identity system would look like, if it, especially if it was user centered. That, so let, let me go, go and ha have a stab at answering that. I think that part of the challenge is that if we're designing that identity solution, we need to understand all of the requirements where that digital identity might get used. I, I think, to be honest, I think we are still going through the process of understanding all the different use cases which require identity. Um, I think there are many times when we, we just know who, who we are, each other is and we rely on the fact that we know or we we think it's a low risk, and therefore we say, oh yes, I, I know the propri proprietor of this shop, uh, I'm, I'm sure it's them, whereas in fact you don't really know who they are at all. And it's, just, it's not just, of course, individual identity, it's corporate identity as well. If I'm dealing with a, a business, is that really the business, and how do I authenticate that it really is them I'm dealing with? Do I authenticate the, that member of staff and then somehow prove a link from that member of staff to the business? So I think there are some use cases beyond just individual identity that we need to be thinking about as well. Mm. So I agree we should be going for a really straightforward, simple design. And I, I think there is more complexity than there probably needs to be. Um, and certainly when I was co-author of the British Standard on Digital Identification and Strong Customer Authentication, one, one of the things which came through is that, that it is a very complex topic that we need to be thinking about. And there are lots of individual requirements that, that organizations should, should consider. Um, but I think the, the problem is that we don't understand all the requirements. It's, if, if we have more data, we might be able to come to a, a much more straightforward approach. But I don't think we have all the data yet. No. Maybe, maybe to, to add one, one comment to that, I think there's been quite a number of attempts to be creating new identity networks, a decentralized identity network, whether that's sovereign, uh, in one example, ID2020 with a consortium of Microsoft, Accenture, some other large companies, ID Nation uh, in the Dutch region, Disney in Italy. Um, it's a bit like credit card networks where everyone tries to build their own. Um, and there's also a lot of standards work around DIDs and how these credentials can be interchanged. Um, but if you're building a new network, you're facing the issue of that marketplace issue of having a lot of Credentials, but nobody who accept these or there's no users if there's no use cases and um, so there's no point in having that identity wallet if it's unusable um, so I think having having an ecosystem that is able to move these credentials in identity wallets um, across different silos uh, is probably the, the the way to go which can be biographic attributes that should be coming from a government, it could be credit scores, which is an identity um, that comes from my bank or my credit card uh, network, um, or many other identity attributes that may not be issued by a government, but that we use on a daily basis. Um, but for that to be usable, it needs to have yeah, that trust framework and that interoperability, um, so we could use it for yeah, pretty much anything that we're using our physical identity uh, today. Mm. And, and, and you've got travel pass, haven't you? So you, that's. Well, this IATA. IATA yeah. has developed IATA yeah. travel pass, yeah. yeah. I don't work for IATA. I no. chair a, a working group within IATA for a facilitation working group. Um, but IATA travel pass is uh, exciting. There's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of all kinds of uh, uh, passes being developed. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to quickly link into what they were saying, and mm. um, I always like to simplify things and bring back things to, mm. I mean, we have a system, which is, again, I go, come back to this, the physical documents. And I think we can hugely improve that system if we go digital. There is that opportunity, because instead of me checking into a hotel, giving my passport, and in the old days it would be a copy made, 
and they had books and books and books stored or with copies of uh, anybody's uh, passport. Now, that's a scary thing. Mm. Right now, what you can do is maybe just share whatever you need to share and whatever the receiver is authorized to have to perform the service that they need to do. So we can make it even better. You can prove your identity and then the hotel just gets your, uh, your name and your passport number, but knows it's from a trusted source and knows it's a verified source and the issuer is trusted. So we can mm. even, we can make the, the system we have, but much better. Mm. Again, I don't have to, if I want to buy a bottle of wine, I don't have to show my, all my details, mm. but just this green check mark. Yeah. So, but I, then I, I uh, concur with what you're saying because there's a lot of uh, preconditions that need to happen. Yeah. So, so, and so we're not just digitizing, we're enhancing in what you're, you're saying there. So we're, we're creating new and safer experiences for people and data minimization in itself adds a great feature, but it also adds complexity that's got to be oh. dealt with on, on the, the delivery side and then the, the record keeping side. So, I mean, it, and it's a really, really interesting question. I mean, I, I, the Open Identity Exchange, our trust framework template's got 21 boxes of things you need to do to make digital identity successful, of which about three are technical. All the rest are procedures, rules, legalities, standards, um, standards user, user considerations, principles that need to be yeah. put in place. So um, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because this, this, all of that is an inherently complex infrastructure, and it's not... It's getting to the point where this isn't a technical problem to solve, it's this yeah. legal and rules problem that needs to go around it, the trust framework element that needs to go with it. Yeah. Um, Another I mean, question from the audience. Yeah. Got time for, for one more. Okay. Good morning and thank you. Um, surely sovereignty should be the data that sits behind the identity and self-sovereignty should be the entry point. I can delete my bank account, but I can't delete myself unless I kill myself. So what does the panel think about sovereignty sat behind the data which sits behind the identity? And perhaps the use of DLT to underpin it? Okay. Do you want to take that one? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, can, I, can, I can give a view on that if you wish. It's quite a... a yeah, a, go for a, it. A, a, are you, do you want to? No. So, I mean, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's quite a technically complex question, I guess, in terms of um, the, the kind of sovereignty of the so this is about sovereignty in the individual versus the data itself yeah so it's almost yeah. like you're mixing identity with the information that's required and therefore we have multiple login accounts multiple identities we have one identity what if you dual citizenship the data that the u.s cares about sits behind my identity so what i mean by sovereignty is who controls and owns and can change the data behind the identity make sense if you yeah. use the privacy by design principles, you share what you need to share and what you're authorized to share, but that's not the answer, right? Because uh, I, I think I'm a bit lost trying to. <laughs> so, but you mean that, yeah. uh, so for instance, I book, uh, oh, uh, wait, I book a flight, I share my identity, but then my whole travel <coughs> history, that's what you mean, where it ends up. Well, the U.S. has it. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you should have one root identity, um, but you're not you're not sharing the identity information with everyone. You're you're essentially cryptographically proving that you. It's like saying that you know the password without revealing the password, but you can prove that you know the password, and the one that you're proving it to accepts that credential that you know the password, but nobody is sharing the password in itself, if that makes any sense. So just to try and pick this up, so, so for me this goes back to the original Latin definition of identity, which goes back to the word idem, which means the same. So it's the sameness. So if you're, I'm trying to prove that this is Nick Mothershaw, then there are all sorts of things I can use to go and prove it really is him. I can look, check his uh, government documents. I can 
uh, check it, records associated with him, I can check his height, shoe size, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And the more things I check, the more confidence I have that this really is Nick Mothershaw. But there's still a slim possibility it isn't. But I think your point is that it, the data is the way you match this physical representation of Nick Mothershaw mm -hmm. to the virtual representation in data that it is. And linking the, all those data points together, that core, I don't know, um, one ring to rule them all, quoting all the rings, um, that, that link between all those points of data, that is, I think, what you mean by identity. It, is that right? sits behind that data, thank you, what sits behind that data is what's needed to be shared. So it seems to me, if you go to first principles, identity should not be blurred with data points. If I had hair, I could change my hair colour. So the fact that it was brown in the UK government and now I've made my hair blonde, like, who owns that data? I do, because I can change it. So I own the sovereignty of my hair colour, although I've got no hair now. Uh, the, my passport number is owned by the UK government and the American government. I got dual nationality. So surely sovereignty is a data problem, not an identity problem. That's the question. Make sense? Yeah, so it's your, it's your data. Maybe offline it afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, mean, I think that one of the, the key thing, point to draw out of that is that, again, back to the complexity question, there's the core identity that we're trying to digitise here, and that might be going back to a, a government document. So it, it simply says, I, I digitise my passport, I've now got a, I, I can call that a digital identity. But what we tend to be talking about with, with, when, we talk, when we say digital identity is much more than just the core identity, because we've already talked about COVID vaccine things. They are attributes, they are things, you know, they are other things I've gathered um, that show that I'm, I'm entitled to do something in the case of coming to this conference, uh, or eligible to do something. And we want to combine all of that, my core identity and all the things that I'm able to do, all in one thing. And maybe we're under-describing that with the term digital identity. It's more than that. I don't want to use the word digital life, because that's probably a burnt term, but it's, 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 it's not just my identity, it's everything else about me. And that's why this is, this is complex, and, and why if we try and solve all of that at once, we'll probably never get there. <laughs> so if we, you know, to, to wrap up on the kind of question of adoption, um, I think we, yeah, we, adoption will probably start in key use cases. We're seeing it starting to adopt now with things like COVID certificates that we're all using t today. And if we, we wouldn't have dream, dreamt of that two years ago, that we'd all be proving something about ourselves using a QR code to access an event. Um, so we're, we're really seeing this accelerate now. Um, but I think it's our, our duty you know, as, as an identity industry to work out how we do tackle that slice by slice so that we can achieve this goal for end users it's got to work for the end user at the end of the day they're, they're the most important person in that and the key thing we we hit on in here I think was education they're not going to use this unless they believe it's safe and they understand how it works so that's one of the real key key things that's going to drive adoption I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap up at that Laura thank you Oh uh -huh.